Pinball. The world's leading form of entertainment once upon a time. Go to any pub, bowling alley, seaside resort or arcade in the 1950s and 60s and you're bound to have run into a pinball table or two. They've been around since the old, old days and despite taking a knock from a certain other form of entertainment in the mid 80s, they've never really gone away. In fact, they had something of a renaissance in the digital age. Pinball video games have been around almost as long as video games themselves. Their score chasing sensibilities and visual elements were informed by pinball in the early days. And later on, creating an engine capable of realistic pinball action became a programming challenge for many developers. So today we're going to take a brief look at the history of pinball video games. Where they started, where they ended up, and what happened in between. And hopefully we'll have some fun playing them too. From what I can gather, it all started with the TV pin game by Chicago Coin. Which wasn't on a TV, it was an arcade cabinet. And it wasn't really a pin game. But let's not sweat the details. There's not a whole lot of information out there about this one, but we do at least have the flyer here, which says it's the industry's most revolutionary new game. Interestingly, it does appear to be in colour, which I suspect is a colour overlay. So this looks to me more of a breakout style game than a strict pinball game, but it's definitely worth mentioning, if only for the name. The following year, Atari hit back with Pin Pong, another arcade game. Hey, they didn't get it first this time. Now, without having played TV Pin Game, it still appears to me that the older game was a little more advanced. But, and here's the kicker, Pin Pong has flippers. Wow. The flyer's another barrel of laughs, let me tell you. Atari's unique new concept. Pin Pong is so unique, it's in a class by itself. They weren't too far wrong there, really. Interesting way of spelling algorithm, and they put a hyphen between pin and ball, which is a bit weird. Sounds great, doesn't it? Well, we don't have to take Atari's word for it. Good lord, has this game not aged well. Now, to its credit, these are early days, and video pinball had to start somewhere, but it's difficult to go back to this and say that it's a good game. The physics are just all over the place, with seemingly no consistency whatsoever. You'll note that the flippers frequently go through the ball, which itself looks like it goes in an entirely random direction each time it bounces off something. I think the plan is to hit all eight of these drop targets, but since you effectively have no say over where the ball goes, that's a more difficult task than it sounds. I've got it within one target of completion, but that's as close as I've got. Come on, come on, nearly there. No! It doesn't help that the flippers are about a mile apart, so any progress in this game just feels more luck than judgement. This is making me uneasy, let's move on. While we're on the subject of 70s arcade games, we have to give another mention to GB and its sequels, since they're quite heavily influenced by pinball elements. You've got bumpers, drop targets, outlanes, rollovers, and a spinny thing. No flippers, sadly, although after seeing Atari's attempt, maybe that's for the best. Its sequels, Bombi and QTQ, are essentially the same thing with a different design. But without these, Namco wouldn't have been able to make... Well, I'm sure you know that story already. Now you may be thinking, as I was, what's the point of these? You're introducing some pretty basic pinball games into a world where real pinball is alive and well. I don't get it. But what I do get is bringing pinball home. Not many people can fit a full-size pin game in the homes, but an Apple II on the other hand, now that's a little bit more viable. Now this is more like it. This one actually looks like a real pinball table. Well, in terms of design that is. Perhaps not so much in terms of the wacky colours, but this is what early adopters had to put up with. Rasta Blaster was an important evolutionary step in video pinball. It looks, feels and plays a lot more like the real thing. And what's more, it could be played at home. It's still a pretty basic table, there's not really a lot going on. A few rollovers, drop targets, bumpers, a kick out, and a spinner. That's all you really need though. And for a game of this vintage, it's impressive to see all these flashing lights and interactive elements in play. The physics are still an issue though. The ball doesn't fly in random directions this time, and the flippers act like they're supposed to, but it's still nowhere near realistic. Playable, but clumsy. The Apple II saw a couple more pins in its lifetime, which introduced a bit more narrative to the equation. David's Midnight Magic was first, followed by Night Mission Pinball. Midnight Magic is a bit more complex than Rasta Blaster. It has this multiple playfield idea with two sets of flippers to control. In fact, it's a very wide table. Looks almost disproportionate. Anyway, the physics aren't dissimilar from the earlier game. They're slightly improved, but the ball handles a lot more like a ping pong ball than a solid steel sphere. It also seems like the ball and flippers are too small for the rest of the table, so it's difficult to consciously aim for these targets. Night Mission takes it a step further by introducing a theme for the table. 
and by slightly improving the physics again, giving some weight and heft to the ball. There's even an interesting motion blur effect when it moves at speed. His table is a bit weirdly laid out though. Check out this bumper, which is very good at swatting your ball straight into the drain. That shouldn't really happen in pinball. This one's aged the best of the three, perhaps in part because of its narrative, light as it may be. A pretty good showing from the old Apple II, but these are only one table each. Imagine if you had the ability to play millions, billions, infinite pinball tables in the comfort of your own home. Well, Bill Budge had that idea as well. He wasn't about to leave his pinball prowess locked away in his own head, so he created the pinball construction set, which is exactly what it says on the tin. There was a group of engineers there working on um, the Apple III on the OS and ProDOS, and they were totally obsessed with pinball. And they would, um, you know, be excited about ha having a game developer there and trying to encourage me to make a pinball game. You can see on the, on the, on the right-hand side that, that you have a parts kit, and on the left-hand side you have um, a boundary, an empty board, and, and um, the board was, um, the polygon on the board could be edited, so there was a polygon editor in here, and you could drag pieces from the board and drop them in. I, I'm not going to monkey around with it. Pinball construction set gives you a whole smorgasbord of delightful components to use. Flippers, bumpers, rollovers, saucers, kickouts, spinners, ramps, kind of. In fact, I can't really tell what half of this stuff is. It's definitely a game that needs the manual. It's also possible to reshape the playfield, if you really want to. You know, trying to reconstruct a pinball table from memory is hard. I'm trying to remake the table kings and queens here. Could you tell? Let's load up one of the tables that it came with. This feels basically the same as Budge's first effort, just that you can make your own tables instead. I like the concept, but it's very fiddly, and it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of capability outside of placing objects down. Whereas in a real table, you get objectives, modes, and other such frippery. Still, I could see myself having a lot of fun with this if I was still a wee lad, who happened to own an Apple II. There was a follow-up to this for the Mega Drive titled Virtual Pinball, but it's not very good, and we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Around this time, video games were becoming a major talking point. Poised to knock pinball off its throne as the king of arcades, games such as Space Invaders, Pac-Man and Galaga were making waves in the industry. But for some developers, this was an opportunity to bring gameplay elements into pinball that would never be possible in real life, an idea that games such as Jellico's Pinbo embraced wholeheartedly. Right, there's a lot happening here, and not all of it makes sense. You get these egg creatures roaming around the table. Hitting them doesn't have much of an effect, but sometimes you can make them go flying. I don't know what the pattern is here. What's happening? Wait, wait, why is it now a game of baseball? I cannot hit this ball for love nor money. My bat just goes straight through. I thought we'd be done with that by now. So the thing with Pinbo is that it's a lot of games in one bizarre package. Hitting the ABC rollovers at the top changes which game you'll play, and lighting all the Jellico letters starts the thing. Very abruptly, might I add. They're all ball related games, so you get things like baseball, pool, knocking a clown off a ball, the usual stuff. Problem is, the physics are so wonky that it's difficult to have much say in which game you'll play. But also, once you get into the game, it's difficult to have an active role in playing it. To make matters worse, in many of the games the flippers shrink and can be moved around. But they move at such a glacial pace that it's safer just to leave them where they are. The arcade really isn't the right place for video pinball. I mean, the real thing wasn't very far away, and it was usually the better choice. Sure, pinball has some fantastical elements that you won't be able to recreate on a real pinball table. But if it's not as much fun, then what's the point? It's an interesting concept, but I think they bit off slightly more than they could chew with Pinbo. <laughs> Pinball had to act if it wanted to stay relevant. And while it did end up filling a niche of its own, cult fanbase included, there was a period where manufacturers had to experiment a little. It was moderately successful, though it wasn't really enough to keep as a gameplay feature. What they did was take pinball games and weld them haphazardly to video game elements. What resulted from this bizarre marriage were pins such as Baby Pac-Man from 1982. Let's take a look. This one honestly feels a bit shoehorned. It's like they had half a pinball table and half a video game and a big roll of duct tape. The pin doesn't really interact much with the game at all. In fact, it doesn't come into play at all until Pac-Man goes off the side of his maze. 
Not a whole lot else to say about this one, but it's yet another example of Pac-Man weaseling his way into a game that isn't his. I'm not sure about these hybrid games. If I wanted to play a mediocre arcade game, there would have been plenty to choose from in 1984. Just like there'd be a million and one fully-fledged ping games to play. I can see how they would have been a novelty back in the time, but I'm not surprised to see that they didn't really catch on. Take Granny and the Gators, for instance. Granny cannot row to save a life, literally. Once again, the pin and the game are too disparate, and there's not enough of either to make this a good value proposition. The best way to do this would be to have the game react to what's going on with the table, sort of like a glorified dot matrix display. There were lots of others like this in later years, such as Revenge from Mars in 1999, but they were dwarfed by real pinball tables. Anyway, we're getting a bit sidetracked here, let's get back to pinball video games. Here's Nintendo's very own take on pinball. It's got that NES look to it already. The table is stretched across two screens which tragically don't scroll. This was before Super Mario Bros after all. It's a pretty standard pinball game once all said and done. It's got that Nintendo sense of playfulness. Rollovers are chicken eggs that hatch, there are penguins and seals knocking around, and there are even some playing cards. Nice little easter egg for Nintendo fans there. There's also a little bonus game which involves Mario trying to rescue Pauline from what can only be described as an existential nightmare. But it's really freaking difficult. I only managed to save her once and it was definitely luck rather than skill. Otherwise, there's not much more to it. Now, there were a few other pinball games released for the NES. One of them was Pinbot, which shares its name with a real pinball table. Not sure how close it can really be based on the previous game, but here goes nothing. Wow, I was totally not expecting this. So here we have perhaps the first licensed pinball video game, a conversion of the venerable 1986 table Pinbot by Williams. And it looks, sounds and plays far, far better than Nintendo's effort, even if it did come five years later. It's also by Rare, which explains why it's so technically impressive. One thing I must mention is that we have a scrolling playfield this time. It's hard to fit a vertical table on a horizontal display, so lots of pinball games had scrolling screens, as we'll see the further we go on. And it raises some issues, especially with things like, say, multiball. I can only see one ball at any one time, so it becomes unmanageable at best. It's like if you pressed your face up against the glass. But despite all this, I'm still amazed by Pinbot. It's a technical marvel, the music is good, the speech is impressive, and it's definitely worth a play at least once. It's no secret that the PC Engine was a much more capable system than the NES. It's a shame it didn't catch on, because what a wonderful machine it is. Maybe it's because it didn't have a decent pinball game. Well, okay, it had one or two. The first was Alien Crush, which is based on the horror imagery of HR Giga. Now, think about this. Pinball's never been a particularly serious game. If it's not cartoon characters, it's caricatures. It's silly voice clips and dot matrix animations, and it's designed to raise a smile, to make you laugh. Even the most straight-laced pins have been a little tongue-in-cheek. And yet, Naxxotsoft decided that Giga was the direction they wanted to take the pin. Yes indeed, the man who was horrified by his own work. Great idea. So from that alone, it's got kind of a repulsive overtone. I feel a little uncomfortable playing it. Between the phallic flippers, the mouths with far too many teeth, and the multi-eyed alien creature that vomits out facehuggers, it's just unpleasant. And to top it all, once you peel back the aesthetic and get to the meat of the thing, it's just any old pinball table. Nothing special at all. In fact, it's not very far removed from David's Midnight Magic, just with better physics. There's a bit of a bonus game in which you have to fight a centipede thing with a pinball. That's quite a good concept, and it can be fun to try and get it to fall apart in one hit. By the way, can we talk about how weird it is to play pinball with a controller? Later on we had shoulder buttons, which felt a lot more natural. But for NES, PC Engine, and later Mega Drive, it's an odd setup. Good luck being able to nudge in any of these games. And this music, doesn't it sound familiar? One more thing, it doesn't scroll, which leads to this migraine inducing flickering when the ball is near the eyeball bumpers. Ouch. Well, it must have been reasonably successful because it actually had two sequels, Devil's Crush and Yaki Crush. <laughs> Devil's Crush is pretty much more of the same. The table is much larger, with a few more objectives to complete, and there are even more bonus levels too. It feels a bit aimless to me, and I found it almost impossible to get my ball up to the top level, but at least it scrolls properly this time. 
Yaki Crush for the Super Famicom is the weakest of the three. I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. It feels like a complete rehash of Devil's Crush, but the design of the table means that you'll lose your ball for reasons beyond your control. The original was also remade for WiiWare in 2008. Yeah, good luck playing that one nowadays. So from this we've seen Video Pinball take some huge steps forward in terms of its tech. While the gameplay has remained virtually identical, the graphics, and more importantly the physics, have seen noticeable improvement. We've seen some crap, and we've seen some bigger crap, and a few good games too. But Pinball and Home Gaming Systems was just getting started. Join me next time, where we'll see what the 16-bit computers had to offer, from the Amiga, Mega Drive, DOS, and beyond. See you for the next one.